What is our application pipeline methodology? Well, it started with Alliance about three years ago. Uh, that's when we created our enterprise architecture group. And our enterprise architecture group sat down and said, you know what? There's a better way to deliver desktops and applications to the endpoint. But it's very, very confusing. So we thought about it a little bit. We started talking to some companies. We started developing what we consider best practices to be the most economic and efficient way to deliver applications and desktops to a company's endpoint users. The good thing about this was we had a lot of cooperation because it was very confusing. The bad thing was it was hard to find a project that was big enough that we could actually implement all the thoughts that we had. And that's where Ruben Spruitt from PQR had written a white paper called the BDI Smackdown. Now, I don't know, has anybody read that white paper out there? Ruben did something different, even though there's a lot of technical white papers around BDI. Ruben was the first one to take a look at the virtual desktop and, and basically as a global view, and then group things together and create a definition for each one of the technologies, and then create a differentiation between the delivery points. Now, Ruben had some very good concepts in there, but it took a gentleman from our first project at the Lux Corporation, Scott Valeri, to take these components from Ruben's white paper, take a look at what the Lux Corporation had to do, the requirements they had, the challenges that they faced, and develop it and create a process that would work for them. And Deluxe is a, is a very large corporation, um, a very diverse group of users. And Scott was able to segment out the users, identify the key components to put together this, this process for them. Then that's where we got involved. Um, we went up and started talking with Scott. We helped fill in a couple of small blanks around how to do an assessment on the front end, uh, looking at packaging up servers and taking that cookbook that you've got that you built your servers that may take you three or four days to go to build um, from bare metal to what you put into production. And we worked with them implementing Scott's plan. And it's still a process today. I think Mike and Dean are both going to talk to you a little bit about that. But it seems that Scott's ideas worked out very well. We took, at the end of the project, we took what we learned, because I think all of us who were involved would say that we know a lot more now at the end of the project than what we knew at the beginning. As we were working with other clients' projects, we uh, um, added some features. We found our problems and solved them with other vendors. And so that's what brings us today to the application pipeline methodology that we've worked on with our customers. And that is also included into a handout that you have in your goodie bag. Now you'll notice that the application pipeline that we have um, consists of five main components. There is the assessment and app preparation component where we actually start before any project kicks off. We go out and we identify what the end users are doing, the applications they're using, how their hardware is set up, the bandwidth requirements, what's going on with their applications. You know, can it be virtualized? Are they multi-user enabled? Next component is a server build. So, um, can the apps be virtualized? What are the different components that we need to put on for brokerage services? Then you've got the, as all IT projects have, the server and infrastructure. What kind of hardware is needed? The storage in the back end, bandwidth, routers, switches. How do you back everything up? Next, of course, is you've got to understand what's going on with users. Through a user type portal or window, we try to to make a similar interface depending upon what kind of a user it is. Is it a VDI user? Is it a, uh, a stream app user? Okay. And then at the end, of course, everybody's concerned around the user interaction of these. A lot of companies are on Windows XP. How do you get to Windows 7? How do you lock these guys down and secure them? How do you handle their, their profiles and manage the users? Where are they printing? Where are they located at? When they switch locations, geography wise. At the end of this, we take the entire application pipeline methodology and we implement it through four basic phases. The first phase looks a lot like the first component, where we do an assessment. That's the assessment that we're giving away here towards the end of the day. Understand what kind of architecture and technology we might need to solve the problems the company or client faces. Phase two is we stand for proof of concept. The technologies that we thought that might actually work for this, we'll stand up a small environment and test them out. They all work together. It seems to address the needs and concerns of the customer. And from that, then we'll draw up an architectural diagram. And this design is how we'll lay out phase three, which is our pre-production pilot. And during the pre-production pilot, we get about 50 users or whatever select key number of users that we have out there to actually use an environment parallel to production of the other environments. And that pre-production environment is where we work out a lot of the kinks. 
and we eventually we evolve that into your production environment. Now that's where we kind of start to step away. Um, we are not a company that wants to stay there and work 40 hours a week for you, month after month after month. Okay, we want to uh, teach a man to fish, not give a man to fish, right? But that's where this bottom section comes in around the monitor. We want to, you have to understand what's going on with the applications and your servers as well as your users. Because not only do you want to manage and support this, but this environment has to evolve. As your, as your users change, you're going to, you may need to add more technologies, add more servers, enhance your performance, depending upon where things sit at. Okay? We will help you through that process, but again, we're trying to teach you guys how to be self-sufficient on the phone. Now, for our presentations today, like I said, each one of these presentations are going to apply to one of these components. We'll talk to you about that as we do the introduction. Each presentation is set up for not only a delivery of information, but then a Q&A session at the very end. If for some reason you need to speak to, let's say Mike gets done with his keynote, and you want to ask him some specific questions, but you didn't have time during the Q&A, you go out to the registration desk. We will get your cell phone number, and we will get a, one of the ladies out there will make a connection between you and Mike, or whoever the presentation uh, person is that you want to speak to, and coordinate a time with you guys when you can meet either during a break, during lunch, or during happy hour. That way you don't have to worry about running around trying to find somebody during mid-sessions. Each session will also have um, Hancock, Woodbury, and Shelby located on a plaque above the door. Then we'll also have a, a sheet of paper outside each door. It's going to tell you this is the session that's going on, this is who's presenting, this is the time, etc., like that. Any other questions that you have? There's several people walking around with the light blue and white technology shirts on. Um, grab any one of those, and they will give you directions. Rest your belt by the bar, by the kind of bar, by the buffet bar. Um, and I think uh, there's tables out there where you can have little individual conversations if need be. So ask one of us will be able to give you the appropriate directions. So that's kind of the overview and the introductions. Does anybody have any questions about the day so far? I know it's early. I don't think I have enough coffee. Got enough snacks. There's sugar in the bags. Keep it going. Hopefully it's All right. And hey, Nick, I was just going to mention one thing too. Sure. Um, a lot of people have been asking. We are going to post uh, every presentation that you see today to our website. It'll be linked from the page that you signed up to attend this event. Um, and I also plan on uh, emailing a link out uh, to that page as well as to everybody. Great. Thanks, Jason. Okay. <clears throat> now I want to introduce to you our keynote speaker for today. Um, as I mentioned, our first big project that we worked on um, that really helped us put our methodology together based on the activities there was with the Deluxe Corporation. Deluxe is located in Shoreview, Minnesota. For those of you who do not know the geographical map in Minnesota, uh, Shoreview is located right north of Twin Cities. So it's kind of a suburb, I guess. Deluxe is about a $1.4 billion company. They employ over 5,700 people. And for those of you who have ever opened up a checking account, you may think of Deluxe Corporation as a check printer. But they're much more than that. They derive over, the majority of their revenue is derived by creating um, innovative solutions and services for small businesses. So they can create a solid brand name to help them gain and retain customers. And so throughout the years, they've got a long customer support service group that actually helps drive and uh, the need that they had around virtualization. So Mike himself has been working in IT and strategic management for IT for over 15 years. Um, he's held many leadership roles in the technical areas of architecture, systems integration, virtualization architecture, and infrastructure. He's held leadership positions within not only small private and medium-sized public build, uh, companies, but also very large Fortune 500 corporations as well. Mike has made quite a name for himself in the companies that he's worked with, and, and I can uh, attest to this as well with our experiences with him. Um, he's considered a visionary leader within his group. He's had several write-up articles. He's done, had received a lot of awards, not only within his company, but without his company. And a lot of the innovative products and services that Mike and his team have put together have gone down to drive real cost-saving dollars to the companies that works, he's worked with. Um, I think one of the big ones has been this project that we're doing with them now um, at, at the West Corporation. So at this point in time, I would like to bring up our keynote speaker today, Mike Rumsa.
many people in the room lean toward point defense? Management, or anything like that? Okay, so we've got techies here, primarily techies. Okay, so I'm talking to the egg hands, right? So you guys can all go to sleep for an hour, right? <laughs> wrong, wrong, wrong. Uh, somebody once challenged me that a good egg head, a good technician, has trained themselves to think outside of the box. I would say that the best technicians train themselves to not only think outside the box, but to think inside the other guy's box. And this is a session where I'm going to invite you all to try to think inside your management's box. Right? They have a different view of things, so the techies look at things from the technology view, from the point of what the stuff does, it's cool. Management has a whole different view on it. So this isn't going to be technical, technical uh, but should have been able to grab some good things out of it. So think inside the other boxes. As Nick said, I've, had, uh, I've been in IT actually for about 30 years. I've been in leadership roles for about 15 of that, worked in a lot of different companies. Um, the key reason I'm up here, uh, and the key reason I'm called a visionary is because I hired Scott and Larry. Uh, Scott was the guy who worked for the bus. And when I took over the desktop uh, of leadership of the desktop architecture, to hire a desktop architect. Um, I saw something in Scott that I thought was worth pursuing. I'll get to that a little bit later in the presentation. But Scott really is uh, sort of the heart and soul and brains of our desktop architecture operation. I think if Scott were here, he would tell you he couldn't have done it without me as his uh, director and leader because he needed somebody to, to do, you know, keep the management columns at bay so that he could go do all the great architecture and engineering work that he did. So the technicians and the leaders um, I, most of my years I spent not in desktop technologies, except for my mom. I don't know my mom, I should say. Um, but it's in the past five years that I've worked in desktop technology. I come more from the server, I've done a little bit of application development, I've been at DPA, um, which actually ended up being a really good background for, for one year. I did as a guy in desktop technology. Um, Is that better? Yeah. All right. Okay. Now you're really going to hear me. Uh, so I think when I first came into desktop technology, I had the perspective, like many server-oriented people, that this was going to be pretty easy. Right? Well, it ended up not being quite so easy, especially in the world over today. So I'll get a little bit more into that later. Um, so uh, a couple things about me personally you're going to find out, so I might as well tell you. Um, I uh, am a musician. I play in a, a rock band part-time. I've done it since I was in ninth grade in high school. If you want to see funny pictures of me, you can go to uk-5.com. But I have a musical theme to my presentation, so that's why. And you'll, you'll get the era of the uh, references as they go forward. So obligatory slide about Deluxe Corporation. Uh, Nick already gave you a little bit of information. This is just a little bit more detail about uh, who Deluxe is and what we've done. Deluxe was created, founded on the cool visual effects. Uh, Ducks, Deluxe was created, founded on the business of uh, checks. And for many years, our, was our only business. And then we got into some small business services and products. And are now, uh, less than half of our revenue is from checks. We're moving into the small business products and services area. Uh, if you have a small business and have small business needs, I highly recommend you to check out our website, www.deluxe.com. Uh, we have three business segments, small business services, which is focused on delivering checks, forms, business cards, stationery, greeting cards, labels, promotional products, uh, merchandising materials, and services such as uh, website uh, hosting, creation, logo creation. Uh, we're getting into marketing services as well to millions of small businesses across the country. Then we have our financial services segment. Uh, this business offers a variety of checks and related products and fraud prevention services that end customers through its financial institution clients. We also use knowledge and understanding of consumer and business preferences to orchestrate outstanding customer experiences for financial institutions. And our third business segment is called, we call it direct checks. It serves both individuals and small businesses that choose to work their checks from a direct supplier. So, marketing pitch over, let's get into the details of the presentation here. All right, here goes. 
That's great, it starts with an earthquake, birds, snakes, an airplane. Lenny Bruce is not afraid. Eye of the hurricane, listen to yourself, churn, world service, no needs, don't serve your own needs. Speed it up on ox, speed, breath, no strength, no ladder structure, flatter with fear, fight, down, height, wire, and a fire represents seven games. You know the song? Right? I actually sing that in my band, that's why I know the words. Okay. <laughs> when I look at desktop technology, I say, it's the end of the world as we know it. Do you feel fine? <clears throat> right? There's big changes coming. And uh, we're in the midst of big changes. So the biggest change, or the most imminent change, is that Microsoft XP will be going off support in April of 2014. 2014, that's three years away. Well, less than three years away now. Right? April 2014 is, uh, well, two years and 11 months away. And uh, so a lot of work's got to get done. And if you're a calendar year company like we are, You've already got your plan set for 2011. If you don't have a plan set to deal with it, you got two years to deal with it, right? Think about that for a minute. If you're a company like Deluxe, you got two years to deal with it, and you got 6,000 desktops, that means I have to transform 3,000 desktops each year in the next two years. That's much greater than the rate that I normally do think. So big issues there. Why is XP being off support such a big deal? Well, XP is old. It's almost 10 years old as an operating system, right? Uh, what, what does it mean to run an old operating system? Well, you can buy computers today that won't run XP, right? So uh, that's one issue. Uh, another issue is you run into old unpatched uh, OSs. At some point, you might be faced with regulatory compliance or contractual implications of running an operating system that does not have patches. And we are faced with some of those um, actually, we're faced with all of those as a company. We have to look at all of those things. Uh, remediation is not necessarily easy. You have to remediate your applications. And you have to remediate your hardware. Application remediation, you might look at you know, somebody like Lux and go, oh my gosh, they've got 6,000 desktops. That's a lot to remediate. But you know what? If we have 50 apps and you have 50 apps, application remediation is just as ugly for you as it is for me. Uh, application remediation can be done via brute force. Get a lot of people and give them a lot of time and have them go figure out how to make things work or there's tools available. Uh, some of the tools that Nick talked about earlier, uh, particularly the aptitude tool, uh, uh, provide a lot of support for that. It's a great way to get things started. Uh, so, from a management view, you really ought to have a plan that says, I'm going to be done with XP by the end of 2013. That would leave me the first few months of 2014 to clean up the little messes that get left behind as you do any project, or to provide a little bit of buffer space for projects like you usually need. Um, if you don't have a plan to get there, you probably won't get there. Right? It's, it's, there's a lot of work to be done. So you gotta do a lot of work. You gotta, you gotta fix this problem. But it's not just a matter of replacing a desktop OS, is it? There's radical changes in the area of desktop technology. You've got terminal services, VDI, application virtualization, remote VDI, tablet computing, smartphones. Uh, you know, data is all over the place. You want your data in your data center and whatnot. There's a lot of things to consider as you go forward to try to figure out how to solve this problem. So. I apologize for the earworm, I just am uh, dropping on your head right now, but hey, it's a small world after all, right? Um, what do I mean by saying it's a small world after all? In today's world, think about where your people are, right? You have people working in your facilities, you have people working in partners' facilities, you might have people working in partners' facilities across an ocean. You might have people working in partners facilities in countries where you wouldn't otherwise do business or there's some you know, uh, risks there. Uh, people are working in their homes more and more. Uh, uh, they're working at coffee shops. They're working on the road. So people are kind of everywhere, the people that you want to hire. I know we, we had to hire a desktop engineer. We were looking for a guy with a certain skill set. Could not find a guy anywhere except Boston. Right? Now we were fortunate this guy happened to want to move to Minnesota, so we got him, but had he not wanted to move to Minnesota, we probably would have hired him in Boston and just worked with the work with him because he was the right guy. So people are everywhere. Which brings up another interesting uh, dilemma. Where is the data that they're working with? OK, 
Okay, well, the data is kind of everywhere too. You've got data on people's desktops. You've got data on, uh, in your facilities on file servers or stuff under desks or you know, wherever. Uh, data is on people's laptops. You might have data on people's smartphones or tablets. Uh, and you sh should have some data in, on servers in your data set. Why is this an issue? Well, think about the situation where I have a uh, user who is sitting up in Canada trying to access a database where the data, like an access database, where the data is in Chicago. Or consider something that really happened to us. We had a user up in Canada where their database was in Canada and their desktop was in Canada and we wanted to move them to terminal services with the terminal server in Chicago. Okay. Didn't really realize that's what was going on, converted them, and oh my gosh, they've got no performance. Um, so that's one of the aspects of data. Uh, another interesting side note on data, we, we, we moved into a terminal services environment uh, using, uh, uh, from this project that Nick uh, uh, talked about. Uh, and as an experiment, I decided I was going to try using terminal services from a plane just to see what, what would happen. It was a, kind of a fun experience. I logged into our terminal services environment using the wireless network on a plane. And uh, I, of course, accessed several large files, Excel spreadsheets, did a whole bunch of stuff. And all of the data was in the data center, everything worked fine. And then the really fun thing I did is I am Dean uh, Borman, who you're going to hear from later today, uh, one of my associates, and I said, hey, I'm in a plane on our, our terminal services solution. And Dean happened to be in a meeting with all of the terminal services people at the time, all of our support team. And all of a sudden, I had five IMs going. With people going, hey, Mike, here you're on a plane. How's it working? Right? So it worked just great. So you know, the, you know, people are everywhere. They might be on a plane working. They might need to work on a plane. And, and you might have to provide for that. Uh, so one other aspect of this that is uh, interesting is where are the bad guys in our world today? Well, the bad guys are everywhere you have people. Right? They might be a disgruntled employee, they might be somebody who's trolling the area, they might be somebody who's trolling the wireless network outside your facility. Uh, you don't know exactly where they are, but you know they're pretty much everywhere. They might be looking over the shoulder of one of your employees at a coffee shop. Right? So, and they're probably everywhere you have data electronically as well. Right? They could be tapping wires, they could be, as I said, listening in on wireless networks. So there are considerable risks as we move forward in this world, and you have to consider that. So I think my point about this uh, is that you got to think globally. People and data are everywhere, but you have to act, I'm not saying locally, you have to act at a smaller level than that, atomically. Where is that data? Where are those people? How are we protecting them? Okay, next musical reference, my generation. Great song by the movie. You can, you can get what era I, I, uh, I have been using from, so I'm pretty good here. Uh, I'm going to shift the focus a little bit and talk about people in your organization. This is something that I realized I think a little bit late, but uh, it's important to think about as you're going forward. Who are corporate decision makers? How old are they, roughly, generally speaking? Right. It's, it's of course, a, a, a generalization, so it's not always true, but generally speaking, they're in their mid to upper 40s, 50s, or 60s, right? How did they know the corporate world? What was the corporate world like when they came to start work somewhere, right? They remember the office before PCs. They remember secretaries and typewriters and word processing tools. They understand enterprise technology by their recollection of the mainframe, which was a mammoth system it was exactly the same on everybody's desk who had it. There was this big terminal. Everybody worked the same. Change came very slowly. You know, they do quarterly or semi-annual releases of changes, right? That's that's the what that's what they think of when they think of enterprise technology. That's in their heads. They didn't have a PC in their home probably until uh, into their adult life, or maybe well into their adult life, and they witnessed or they enabled the democratization of technology in their company as the PC came in. They were either part of it, or they were fighting it, or they were watching it. But it happened in front of them, right? So the workforce of today, your college graduates, think about them for a minute. They don't know a world without PCs, right? They just don't. They've always had PCs. They use desktop computers in grade school, right? 
Some of my you know, younger kids, they're using them in kindergarten. My kids school kindergarten and start teaching computers in kindergarten, right? Uh, they likely have always had a PC in their home. Uh, they don't really understand enterprise technology. You know, well, what's this? Why does it have to be slow? Why does it have to be the same? I want it my way. I don't want it your way. I want it, you know, just give me what I want, right? They expect access to everything, everywhere. They're texting their friends all the time from wherever they are. They're not sending emails and waiting an hour for a response, right? They are immediate. They have a whole different view of what technology ought to do and how technology ought to work. So, you know, some of the engineers that you hire are going to be of that mindset. And they have to convince the leaders who are of a different mindset that investing in this technology is important. Remember when I said you got to think inside the other person's box? This is where this comes into play. So you got to be aware of that as you go forward. So my term for this slide is mind the gap. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that phrase, but I'm told that over in Europe, the train stations have that posted all over the place because there's there's a you know, somewhere between an eight to twelve inch gap between the platform and where you step onto the train. So if you don't mind the gap, you fall and get injured seriously. Right? So mind the gap. Okay, this isn't a song. This is just a musical concept. Uh, uh, everybody's a drummer, right? Have you ever been in a situation? place where there's a drum set and drumsticks sitting there and there are people right everybody thinks they can drum they walk up they go you know you look at it from the outside okay you got two hands and two feet you hit drums with two hands and you move the, the hi-hat and the bass drum with your feet really easy right they all make it look easy so then they sit down and they start to do something and it sounds awful right because it really isn't easy drumming isn't easy so Everybody, including me as I started getting into this, thought PCs are easy. I've got one at home. It's not that hard, right? Well, how many people at home have had to deal with something on their PC that was caused by someone other than themselves? I have. I had a really fun problem one time. I had a Mac uh, with the OS X on it, which has the dock on the bottom of the screen with all the icons for running the applications. I came home from work one day and half the icons were gone. And so I put them back, came home the next day and a different set of the icons were gone. So this happened for like, was going on for a week and I thought there must be something really, really wrong with my system. So I rebuilt the whole system. A uh, week later, icons are disappearing as I got home and I thought, what the heck is going on with this thing? And one day, I walked by when my five-year-old was using the computer, right? And he was having great fun dragging the icons out of the dock because of the nice poof animation that would happen when you did that. <laughs> so technology is easy. It's just that the users keep messing things up on this, right? Uh, and then the other the other thing is, if you have one computer at home, like you know many of our our older generation people might have, it's different if you have two computers at home, even two computers at home, right? I want to use the computer, my kids on the computer that I want to use, they're doing homework, I don't want to interrupt them, so I go to the other computer. Guess what? My file is on the computer, my kids use it. So the next thing you know, I have a file server. Now I've got you know, more kids, I've got more computers, I've got file servers, I have to have firewalls and antivirus, and you know, it gets complex even in a home these days. So uh, Here's another uh, management phrase you may have heard, I know I have heard this, and it drives me nuts. Why can't I just go to Stuff Mart and get a bunch of $300 laptops? You IT guys are so ridiculous. You want to charge me? You want a thousand bucks for a laptop? What's wrong with you? Right? Well, you really do get what you pay for in terms of durability and features. There's a reason the more expensive laptops are more expensive. Uh, there was a company in the Twin Cities that shall remain nameless. Um, uh, this really happened in this company. They had a satellite facility that was opening up. It was a sales-oriented facility, and, and the uh, folks out there decided that they were going to go to Stuff Mart, bought a bunch of $300 laptops. I don't know what manufacturer they were. They were Acer or something. And they put Windows 7 on them, and you know, brought one on their merry way. Then they wanted to connect up to the corporate network. Well, we, we use Windows XP still as our standard. We're working on our Windows 7 laptop solution. And uh, we require hard disk encryption on all laptops for our company, as most big companies do. So we went to, we, we got them convinced, okay, you can use XP. Uh, well, guess what? XP won't run on these machines. 
darn, right? So that was uh, fault number one. Then number two, we tried to uh, use the laptop encryption Guardian Edge. Guess what? These machines didn't have the trusted platform module 1.2 chipset, so the encryption software wouldn't work. So we had to rebuy for them uh, laptops at about a thousand bucks a pop because the 300 bucks a pop points is just didn't work. So it you know it happens. And here's another one. I don't know if you hear this one. I hear this one a lot. We can just get by with older versions of the software. Why do we need to keep upgrading? You know, come on. It's just you know it's all just the lines in Palmer's pocket, or Bill Gates' pocket, or somebody's pocket. Uh, and I kind of uh, counter that with, well, what do you suppose the software vendors have been doing, right? I mean, they, they keep putting more features and, and enhancing the software. There's reasons why people buy it and use it, you know, so uh, an aspect to think about. Uh, what are the incoming employees used to using, right? Kids out of college aren't coming in, they're not, they don't know Office 2003. They would probably look at it and go, ooh, what's that, right? Uh, and what are your customers and associates using? Changing documents, you understand that story very well. Um, so another story, true story from a company that I know, but which shall remain nameless. Uh, there was a situation where the CEO and one of the other C-level executives were working with the board to put together a presentation. And as is typical in this kind of situation, the timeline was really tight. So uh, along about one in the afternoon, they received from the board member the presentation, which was a Microsoft PowerPoint 2007 document. They dutifully opened it on their XP laptops with uh, PowerPoint 2003, and nothing was there. The presentation was corrupt. Oh my gosh, okay, well quick, give a call to Bob, the uh, handy dandy desktop engineer support person. Bob comes over and takes a look at it, does some research and finds out, oh, Microsoft just released information that there was a patch for Microsoft XP that inadvertently causes PowerPoint presentations that were created in the 2007 version of PowerPoint to lose all of their images when they get opened in the 2003 version of PowerPoint. Okay, well, Bob, being a good, uh, a good desktop support person, says, I can solve this. These are the executives. I'll just give them PowerPoint 2007 problem solved, right? So he goes and gets the, installs it on their laptops. And uh, I, I, I I don't like to swear, so I will, I will color this a little differently. The uh, executive that opened PowerPoint 2007 got the presentation, opened it, and sure enough, there's the presentation is there. But then he looks at PowerPoint 2007 and the ribbon and goes, what the heck is that? How am I supposed to do this, right? So those guys, those two guys, those c little people spent till midnight learning enough about Office 2007 so they could get this presentation done. You know, had they had the right tool, had they known how to use it, they probably would have been done at three or four in the afternoon. So, Upgrading your software can be important to keeping things clean. Um, the bullet here at the bottom of the page uh, is not a direct link, but I think one of the things that can help us a great deal is to find sources of industry information and use it. Right? Gartner will tell you why people upgrade, who's upgrading, why they're upgrading. Forrester can tell you that. Burton Group. Um, you got to you got to bring in outside help on this one because it, it, it's a it's a tough it's a tough uh, sell. All right. You gotta serve something. Is your end user, your customer, are they always right? Are they the one whose person that IT has to solve regardless of what they're asking for? That's typically what your desktop support people think because that's who the desktop support people talk to, the, the end user, right? Or is your end user a beneficiary are they a recipient of a limited set of services that are provided by somebody else? Um, this is the typical view of your management teams. That's the typical view of my of the architecture team at the Lux where I work. Uh, I have a peer manager who manages support. And we, we've gone round and round on this one because the support manager's view is that the end user is the customer. And my view is that the CIO is the customer because he pays the bills. Right? And that, that does create a lot of friction. And it, it does have a big impact on how smoothly you can move things forward. Uh, and here's another little thought. Are your end users sources of innovation, right? How do you enable that in our new world? Um, if you think about what desktop technology did, the democratization of technology that came as a result of desktop technology, what it really did is it allowed users 
to innovate dramatically. The spreadsheet, the word processors, right? They could solve problems using technology that they couldn't solve before. Now, IT didn't do a really good job of helping shepherd those solutions into something that could be maintained and supported. So you, like us, I'm ashamed to say us, might still have Access 97 databases doing critical business operations, some of which you don't know about until you try to virtualize or move the terminal services, right? So, but the reason that is is because people want to solve problems. So that's just an angle that you need to think about as well. So is your CIO or your executive, the customer, are they willing to pay but only for business value? This is where the techies got to listen close. Or is your CIO Santa Claus? They just provide whatever's needed. I've seen that model, it doesn't happen often, but you know, if you're in that model, enjoy it. It's, it's really fun. <laughs> uh, is your CIO the exclusive agent for change? Is the only change in your desktop technology what is provided for you know, with funds that are directed and controlled by your CIO? So just some things you gotta think about. Uh, I want to go back to the business value thing for a minute. Um, I had a discussion, uh, I've had discussions with my CIO over the years. In fact, the, the guy who used to be the CIO, our former, our former CIO, the day he came to the company, uh, I just so have, happened to have had a discussion set up with the CIO that day to talk about upgrading to Office 2007. Well, the old guy had left two weeks ago and the new guy came in and we left it on the agenda, right? So his first day in the office, I'm in front of him talking about Office 2007. No idea who he is or what's respect. Turns out he hates Microsoft uh, almost as much as he hates Oracle. I'm sorry if there's Microsoft or Oracle here, but he did. Um, anyway, he was, you know, he was kind of taking the, the tack of, well, I, you know, we can get by with Office 2003. It works fine. Why do we need Office 2007? So I spent the next three years trying to get it in his head why this is important. We decided to skip Office 2007. We are actually upgrading to Office 2010 this year. I did sell that. Um, one of the things I did that turned his head was I put together a little analysis. I said, okay, how much time does the cost of the office license represent? And I figured out that for us, it was about a minute a day. And I took it to him and I said, do you realize that if Microsoft Office could save, save our people on average one minute per day, we would have paid for the license cost. His response was, well, you know, that's not real revenue. I said, of course it's not real revenue. It's not productivity, but it is effectiveness, right? If they get two documents from the outside world that were uh, in a newer version of PowerPoint and they have to wait for them to be converted, I just paid for it because now they can continue to do their work instead of sitting and waiting, right? So when I say business value and you gotta think like the leaders think, you gotta think like the executives think, that's the way they think. You know, I know the, the, the effectiveness and, and that kind of thing isn't real dollars. You go, yeah, I know that's not real dollars, but it's real time. It's real something. There's something there. So my point here is uh, you need to define the customer to define the service. All right. The initial for you from both sides now. Uh, this is kind of related to the last slide. Are we trying to do personal computing? personal productivity, social media, uh, the consolidated view of all of your digital identities. What happened with my slide? Oh, there it is. Sorry. Are we trying to do enterprise desktops, access the corporate systems alone, uh, one size fits all? Or are we trying to do both? I think we're headed toward doing both. I think we're headed toward bring your own computer where the endpoint device doesn't matter, the user can bring whatever they want to consolidate their digital identities, and IT will provide the corporate systems in a shell or a virtualized package or a terminal services type environment where I can safely give them the corporate systems and safely let them use what they want to use. It won't happen if we're not ready for it, if we're not thinking about it, if we're not thinking it's gonna go that way, but that, that's where I think it's gonna be. Another interesting thing, I'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute as well, uh, as well, uh, well is are we aligning the solutions to the user or the user to the solutions? In the old desktop world, it was you align the user to the solution. It's a piece of hardware on a desktop. It's metal, it runs an OS, it runs these five apps, everybody gets the same thing, 
it's all about the piece of hardware. In the new world, it's about the user. What tools and technologies does the user need? How many people have had a preview of SCCM 2012? Anybody? Uh, Scott, our, our desktop architect, went to do a, a preview presentation on 2012, and he said the SCCM guys in the room, to a person, were baffled because SCCM is moving to a user view. It's all about the user. It's not about installing <coughs> software on a machine. It's about delivering an application to the user no matter where they log in from, what machine they log in from. This is a big change. So I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. So are we, are we doing services based on hardware or aligning solutions to the user? So bottom line there is we're sort of losing control of the endpoint. Just deal with it. Get ready for it. You know. Okay. So with all the drivers and possible solutions, it's important to take steps, not to have to say, I was in the right place, but it must have been the wrong time, right? I got all my desktops out there. I'm able to control my desktops perfectly. I'm able to install applications on the desktop. Oh, but that's what you wanted four years ago. Whoops, right? There are so many choices available in desktop technology. You've got physical, virtual, cloud. You've got multiple variants on each choice. And choices have consequences. If you make the wrong choice, it puts you on a bad trajectory. It will take you a long time to recover. If you're thinking desktops and Windows 7 for all of your employees, and then and then you know somebody comes along and says, guess what? We want to do remote. Oh, ouch! Right? We'll set up an office across in Ireland. Oops! You know. So it's important to, to think about where you're really going and get on the right trajectory. Uh, and the old saying, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. The runway's getting short. Uh, you need to think about where you want to be and why. It is very important to create, socialize, and gain approval for a strategy. You must document a strategy. It has to be written down. It can't just be in people's heads. That's very, very important. I can't tell you how many times uh, Scott, our desktop engineer, did a lot of work documenting things, writing things down, and over and over again that was useful because we could pull out the same picture, the same document over and over to explain to you. Remember, we said this is where we're going, and we're, you know, step two along the way. So, very important. One way or another, I'm going to get you. Don't underestimate the skill gap. This, new, this is new technology, it's very different. Some of it is really, really different, categorically different. It's, it's new paradigms. Um, it all looks similar. I'm still delivering Microsoft Word, but the way I'm delivering it is so different. So it, there is, a, you gotta do something about that. Uh, this is a line that comes from my current CIO, who said, figure out what you need for resources, and then be ruthless in getting them. He said, don't, I'm not saying being mean or being a jerk. He's saying pursue it until you have what you need. Don't just assume that you can get stuff done if you don't have the resources. So there are many ways to get resources once you've determined what you need. Uh, training, new hires, consultants. Uh, one model that uh, Scott threw out for me, Scott's a former Navy man, is that when the Navy encounters the need for some new kind of uh, ship or, or, or vessel, uh, or, te or technology on a vessel, what they do is they get a new vessel first and get that new vessel in operation. Then they go retrofit their old vessels for the new technology. So that's another approach is get one new guy in who knows what's going on and then he can help your old guys make the transition. That's in fact what we did. We hired this guy from Boston who was willing to move from Minnesota. Um, we had you know, resumes that looked great. We interviewed 14 people, two people met the criteria, one guy was really the guy we want. We had to hire a guy from Boston, right? Get him, we get him in, he is doing what we wanted to have happen. He's helping our other people adapt to the new technologies and, and figure out where we need to go. So as a manager, right, all you eggheads in the room, we really appreciate you because good people make me look smart. Right? <laughs> so very important. Okay, for my last slide, how many people know Jimi Hendrix? How many people can name the drummer in the Jimi Hendrix experience? I can. <laughs> Buddy Miles? No. 
No, I'm thinking no. Okay. Well, uh, so my last uh, slide is titled Them Changes because I'm not a big David Bowie fan, and Buddy Miles had a song called Them Changes. So. Uh, So you do not underestimate the impact of all of these changes on people. This is another flaw that, that, that we hit. Uh, we assumed that, that everybody was flying along at the same pace we were and looking at the changes and the new technologies, and in fact, they weren't. Um, you've got your users. It's a big technical change for the users, and that's kind of obvious, and we kind of knew that was going to happen, and we, we worked that through planned brown bags and you know training sessions and whatnot. What bit us was IT. IT didn't understand the changes. So the little story that we have is that we did a, uh, uh, the CIO, CIO asked us for an elevator speech version of what we were trying to do with desktop technology. You know, an elevator speech is one or two sentences, three sentences that really encapsulate what we're doing. So instead of us doing that ourselves, the architecture team, we gave that to the support team to do, who had been working with us all along. It took them four months to put that together. And what they put together actually was helping the support team, not the end users. They didn't get it. We didn't know they didn't get it. They were sitting in the meeting, smiling and nodding, but they didn't get what change was coming. And then corporate leadership also needs to get, you know, what's what, what the impact of the change is. You gotta get them, you gotta get them tuned in to the fact that we really do get the idea that business value is important that this technology is about business value, it's not about cool toys. The problem is there's a lot of cool toys too, so we get excited about cool toys, but they gotta know that we're not just excited about them because they're cool toys, we're excited about, we're excited about them because of the business value that they're going to deliver. Um, and they need to know it does in fact cost money, but there's value at the other end. So organizational change management is critical. So if the slide works right, there's the summary of the bullets that I gave you from each of the slides. This top technology really is a brave new world. Think globally, act atomically, mind the gap. Find sources of industry info and use it. Define the customer to define the service. You are losing control of the endpoint. Document a strategic roadmap. Good people make you look smart and organizational change management is critical.